This show is brought to you by Keeper Brand Apparel, maker of hardcore fishing swag that's super comfy. Get it online at KeeperBrand.com. Also, we're glad to introduce Steam Juice as a new sponsor supporting our show. If you're looking for the best tasting vape juice with only the highest quality USP and food grade ingredients, go to SteamJuice.us. They allow for custom ordering online to suit your needs, and all their batches are made by hand right here in the U.S. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Funny Blunt Truths, episode 20. We've got a very special guest on besides my co-host, Dave. Um, this man, you can find him on uh, online on IMDb on a very long list that would take me all night to go over. Uh, you can catch him playing Derek tonight on uh, Devious Maids on Lifetime TV, uh, 9, 8 Central. You can also check him out on his uh, acting blog at cinnamonmonster.com. We have Edward Hong on the show tonight. Edward, how you doing? Hi there. I'm doing great, man. How are you guys doing? Doing wonderful, Pretty man. Good. Thanks thanks for coming on the show. We really appreciate you you coming yeah, thanks for having me. Hey, Don, I just got to say something. You got to get it right, buddy. Cinnabon Monster. You said cinnamon. Is it, <laughs> should, should I redo it? Should I redo just, it? Just run with it. It's okay, Cinnabon Monster. <laughs> just run with it. Uh, <laughs> It's the Cine, Cinnabon monster. That's a mouthful, though, Edward. I just want to let you know, like that's uh, when you say Cinnabon monster, it's it's like a that's a big thing, you know. So I mean, obviously, you guys are pretty aware of the Cinnabon. I mean, that's the thing you find in airports oh, and malls. It. Yeah. So it. Cinnabon monster is just the creation of that. But there's a story that comes with it. We'll but we'll we can get into that later. <laughs> okay. Well, I was actually just going to ask you because I was reading, I was going over some of your blogs before the show, collecting information. Now. I've actually been following your blog for many years and was a source of information, uh, and I'm not even joking, uh, for a long time. And uh, one of them, though, I was reading was about the time you got to meet Cat Cole, the CEO, yes. the CEO of Cinnabon. Mm-hmm. Like, you really should elaborate on how all that worked out, because I'm sure people are interested to hear how you, why, you, like, the whole Cinnabon thing. Like, they're like, why is this guy called the Cinnabon monster and what's going on? But to you, that was kind of like a, like a marketing niche, right? Like, that was like a thing for you. Yes. Um, so where to begin on this? Um, ever since I was a kid, I've, I was always into Cinnabon. I was, I was like pretty much obsessed with Cinnabon. And, um, it was kind of like my thing. I would always talk about Cinnabon to my parents. I would annoy the crap out of them. Like, Hey, can we get a Cinnabon? And they're like, no, it's full of calories and sugar. It's not good for you. Um, and then it carried over until, yeah, when I moved to LA six years ago to pursue my acting career, like where I'm from, I was born in Yolo, California. That's a story in itself. Uh, <laughs> then moved to New York, Michigan, Korea, for four years, then Virginia for college. And then I moved to L.A. as of six years ago. And then when I moved to L.A., it was, it was I think it was like two years in that a friend of mine suggested, like, you always talk about Cinnabon on your social media. Perhaps it might be a good idea to market yourself with them. And at the first time I heard that, I thought that was a really dumb idea. I was like, why would an actor want to market themselves with a pastry product? <laughs> um, but then overnight, I thought, well, I got nothing to lose, so might as well do it. Um, so then I started creating postcards with the, and then I created like the little Cinnabon monster. Um, and then, you know, the, and then I had the Cinnabon monster Twitter handle and I just kind of took that social media space and I just, started using it like you know what every time i booked a tv show or a commercial i would send casting a ten dollar cinnabon gift card as my thank you mm-hmm. and it at some time it got around that it was like within the the casting offices of la and commercial and theatrical side it was like there's a guy who always <laughs> markets themselves as cinnabon and then awesome. in, the, in the twitter world uh the Cinnabon took a little notice and then it got even more so when there's a friend of mine, this uh, actress named Lin Chen. She is the co-founder of a website called Thick Dumpling Skin, which is a, a website that's dedicated to like food and, you know, in terms of image perception and how they tie together. And so she asked me, why are you into Cinnabon? So I gave them a really long personal story of like how it affected me as a kid. Um, basically in, to put it in a nutshell, Cinnabon kind of helped me through some of the roughest periods of my middle school years. Like a comfort and food? It's like a comfort food in a way because what happened was that I got into trouble with a particular kid. And in a way, it was during this very bad, awkward time, like when the Columbine shooting happened. And to me, I was an extremely ragey, emotional kid. 
And I had a particular bully who we all have had those who would not get off your back. And I, oh, yeah. one day I just kind of lost my crap and I just, you know, just said, Hey, and I just yelled this out loud in, in, in front of him and in front of like, and then it was I echoed through the hall. I was like, if you stop picking on me, I'm going to bring a gun to school and shoot you. And oh, so oof. that went terribly. And so I was immediately sent to the principal's office and my mom was dragged in, um, from her studies because she was studying at the University of Michigan. And so, uh, they were like saying, we're going to have to suspend your son because he's dangerous. Like he's that. And of course there was an argument because my mom was like, well, what about the bully? Like, why isn't he brought in here? And so in the end, they, they decided not to suspend me, but they said, your son needs to go to therapy, uh, because he has a lot of anger issues. And so my mom was like, oh, and then, so she took me out and then, uh, she took me to Briarwood Mall for whatever reason, which is the mall in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I was confused why I'm going to a mall. And then she takes me in front of a Cinnabon and says, I honestly don't know what to do with you, but I'm going to give you a Cinnabon. <laughs> so I ate that Cinnabon as if it was the most amazing thing in my life because I was expecting like a whooping. I was expecting like she's going to beat my ass. Yeah, like she's tough. Whoopings. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, my God, I'm so scared of her right now. So the fact that that Cinnabon replaced the whooping might have instigated like why I feel so strongly to that product. And so that's the story I told Lynn. And when she wrote it and got put into the social media world, that's when the company and that's when Cat Cole took notice of it uh, because they read that story and they're like, oh, my God, this is an amazing story. This is actually right within our motto. Like their mission campaign is to make people feel better to make people feel, you know, you know, get out of their whatever crappy mood they're in. Mm -hmm. And they, they interact with me. They're like, Hey, thank you so much for your story. Like you are amazing. And then the more they got to learn about me, the more they learned, they're like, Oh, so you market yourself with us. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. And then it continued for two more years where we always had this Twitter interaction back and forth. And then, um, it got to a point where, she actually flew over to LA for a business meeting, but along the way, she had an interview, uh, with a, with a guy named Benny Lou, who at that time owned this thing called like a Next Shark, which is like an entrepreneurship website. And so he interviewed her. He asked me if I wanted to come in because he knew that, oh, uh, I was like, oh my God, Cat Cole. And so I couldn't make it. But then three months later after that, she emailed me and she got the email from Benny and saying that, Hey, I'm coming back to LA. I want to meet you in person. When are you free? This, are you free this weekend? I'm like, Oh yeah. So uh, we met, <laughs> oh, we met yeah. uh, totally. And we met, um, we met two years ago and she was, sta she was staying at the downtown Ace Hotel. And so we met at the bar there. And so what, what I thought was going to be like a 20 minute meeting, because I'm like, she's going to, she's not going to have time to just talk. She has other things to do. Ended up being like a three hour session of just like, so let's talk about life. Let's talk about you. And then, then I talked about her, asked her about what's going on with her. And then it became like this three hour bonding session of sorts. And then she asked me, what's my dream? And I said, I want to be the Cinnabon spokesman. <laughs> like th this was a time before Jared was found out to be a child pornography man. Right, right. <laughs> and at that time, I said I want to be the Jared of Cinnabon, and oh, so geez. I can't, I can't use that his name anymore. So I'll just say <laughs> I just want to be your mascot. How about that? Yeah, and that's so a safe, that's a safe thing to say. Yeah, that's much safer. <clears throat> much safer now. And so she was like, yeah, that's awesome. And she told me realistically to budget, and they don't have a lot of money. They have a million dollars total. For advertising, which in the grand scheme of all the food corporations of America and the world, one million dollars is nothing. It's pennies. pennies. Uh, it's pennies. And so I said, look, I'm not I'm not doing this because I expect you guys to pay me. I do this because I love it and I do it because it makes it's a signature thing that that makes me who I am. So the fact that you guys are so down for me to even use your name is fine. And yeah. so that was the meeting. And then fast forward again to like six months ago, actually seven months ago, they shot a film. They were shooting a film called Please Stand By with Dakota Fanning, Alice Eve and Tony Collette. And the role they were looking for, and I kid you not, was the Cinnabon guy. Oh, my God, dude. <laughs> not to interrupt, but I just read this story earlier today. And I'm not joking. I was like trying to fit this in between doing work at work. And I was so enamored by what you're going to, I'm sure you're going to cover it, but I just want to let you know the way you wrote it in the story itself was so interesting. I had to finish it. 
about right. when you're talking about landing the actual Cinnabon roll and the contact and the persistence and all that. I didn't mean to interrupt. I just want to let you know it was very fascinating, but sorry, continue. Uh, so, I, yeah, let's get right into that. Um, so, yeah, a friend of mine forwarded me this breakdown and said, Edward, you need to go in for this. It is calling your name. And I'm like, I know. I'm looking at it. I'm like freaking out. And so I told my representation of my managers and agents like, hey, guys, do you guys know about this? I sent that an email and then I went one step further and I sent the Cinnabon design postcard I've, I've been using for a while. I sent it to the casting office that was casting that movie. I sent it to the director of the movie and I sent it to the production company, the producers of the movie. I was like, I need to be seen for this role. And so <laughs> after I did all that, uh, four or five days go by and then my agent, uh, notified me that I got the addition. So. This was back in like this, like mid December of 2015. And so, uh, I go into the office and there's no one else there because the casting director tells me, so I already saw everyone for your role two days ago, but your reps were so insistent that I had to see you. And apparently you call yourself the Cinnabon monster. And he's kind of like a little like, uh, I don't know who you are. You seem a little crazy. And so, yeah, yeah. I, and I was like, well, at least you're seeing me. So thank you. And so. I do my audition and the first time around, I must have been on crack or something because I was so excited <laughs> that the casting director was like, whoa, okay, great. <laughs> tone but, it down. Like, tone the fuck down. Like, tone it down. And so I did. And then he was like, great, thank you. And then two days go later, and then that's when I get the email saying that you got the part. And I was like, holy shit. Like, I've booked other things before in my past, but like to book this was like, it felt like, my first Christmas, like it was my first, like, holy crap, I can't believe this is real. And so we shot my scene um, two months later. It was like February of this year. And the scene contained like really funny people I knew. Like it was a uh, uh, there was Dakota Fanning, who in the movie, she also works at Cinnabon. So that's where Cinnabon plays a factor in this movie um, and in this. And so uh, I'm having an argument uh, with the side of me and Dakota and the other side represents like these geeky tech guys. And they're, we're having a battle about Star Trek facts. And so she knows everything about Star Trek and they're challenging her on it. And I'm just this obnoxious loud guy who is like egging the other guys on. So the scene was brief, but I got to work with wonderful people like them. And I got to work with, I got to meet Tony Rivoli, who most people at that time before knew him as Zero from Grand Budapest Hotel. Mm-hmm. He's now Flash Thompson in the new Spider-Man movie. Um, awesome. That's so, super cool. So the film is coming out sometime in September, October of this year. Um, it's, so it, I'm excited that it's gonna be, it's gonna be a nationwide release and I got a chance to see the movie for a little bit and it's a great film. It's a, it's a meaningful film about a girl. Uh, an autistic girl who goes to goes to a road trip to submit her Star Trek screenplay and it encounters like a whole crap of obstacles along her way. Wow. That's that's some that's cool stuff, man. That's what I was saying. That story had me going. I was uh, reading it with very much delight. Um, I was curious though, when you're filming on a movie, uh, is it vastly different than filming on a TV set? Uh I would say not really. The the one level I haven't experienced yet in terms of, and I know from other actors who have, like, the, there is a difference between, let's say, uh, let's say filming a TV show or, in this case, Please Stand By. It's 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 in the category of studio indie, so it's an indie film, but like studio finance in yeah. it. But then, like, if one was to work in, let's say, like I had a guy named Kenny Liu who uh, worked on Independence Day, the sequel. And the experience on that one is just like, it's just whatever the crew, number of crew people, number of all this that exists for a TV show or like a studio indie, you multiply that by like by three or four or five for a studio film. So it's just, if you had a small part for a studio film and like one of those blockbusters and you had like a three line, you truly do feel you're like a tiny little sand piece in like this huge, you know, like world of people that are just running around, you know, doing their job. So and it's not to, not to interrupt, but that's got to be kind of crazy. I, I was reading a book once from uh, Michael Caine about how much the actors have to shoulder the weight of the movie 
when you have that. So I understand what you're saying about feeling like a small grain, but really when you're on there, you're essentially, as soon as the director says go, that's, yes. that's all on you, right? That's like a 50, a hundred million dollar movie, all eyes on you. Yes. And so, um, the pressure is definitely on. And I know that in, uh, I don't know this actor, but there was a story that in the acting class that I go to, uh, there was an actor who booked a very small part in the James Cameron movie Avatar. And, you know, the guy was obviously excited. He's like, Oh my God, my first studio. I get to play a Marine. That's amazing. And so he had one line and he said his line and then, uh, he hears cut. But a cut is coming from above him, and there's James Cameron on like kind of like this scaffolding high rise thingy. Oh, he has his shit. megaphone, and he's like, "Cut!" He's like, "What the fuck was that? You call yourself an actor?" <laughs> oh like, what's that? no! <laughs> and so like he just wanted to melt in the floor because it was just like every all the crew members were looking at him. All the hundreds of extras were like, "Wait, what's going? Why is he so angry?" Like. They're all just looking at him and he's just like, this is terrible. Like, this is the worst experience ever because it, I just had one job to do it was to say this one line <laughs> and I have I, James Cameron yelling at me. I think, I think a lot of people don't realize that about actors and performers in general, especially when they, uh, and we just had this conversation before about when people are overly judging, you know, especially online or, uh, we just had this, uh, um, uh, Hilton Ruiz was on and, uh, we were talking to him about that, about like people giving a lot of flack to actors or directors oh, yeah. or whatever it is. And it's like, I don't think they understand. Now, if you're in any form of entertainment, you realize how difficult this shit is yeah, on any pressure. form. Um, and I don't think people realize how difficult it is when you're, when you're on set and you have everybody, like all those gaffers, they're all working. You know, mm -hmm. the set builders have been working for weeks on this stuff or modeling and, you know, setting up the shot, renting the location. And then all of a sudden, the big director that everybody knows, James Cameron's yelling at you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. yeah, Edward, uh, I have some experience with that, like on a way smaller scale. Like I've done quite a few like short films and I like to write and stuff like that. So um, mm -hmm. as far as like acting, I can only imagine the pressure and like the nerves um, because like you have to remember lines, you have to perform a scene in front of people mm -hmm. and it's i mean i've experienced like low level pressure i could only imagine in your case the funny thing is it's like being an actor it's like that's only like the tip of the iceberg in terms of this pressure and the stress that actors face i think uh the other part that i feel like is the more overwhelming part is that because of social media we're constantly aware of our actor peers our friends when they're booking or when they're doing stuff and it can be it can be depressing to read when, uh, especially if you don't have a, you know, good sense of, you know, confidence in yourself uh, where you're not affected by that. But unfortunately, a huge majority of us are affected. So when, you know, we have an actor friend who started like years later than we did and we're busting our balls up, taking acting classes, training our butts off. And then this person comes in and it's like, Oh my God, I just booked my first TV pilot. Like, yeah. and then. Or people who go on to book blockbuster films and you're stuck doing TV shows and, you know, like minor, what you consider minor stuff. And it's a journey for every actor where it's just like not only the challenge of knowing your lines and reporting the set and being a professional, but also just maintaining your career, maintaining your sanity, maintaining that, you know, you're, there will always be people who will get there much faster than you who will be less talented than you yeah. or doing you're doing so much more than they ever will but you're still kind of like in a particular quote unquote lower place while they're doing like they're on red carpets and they're you know hanging up <laughs> yeah, Jake Jill in the hall and Brad Pitt and so Yeah, life yeah. is like funny like that Edward. Um it, it brings me to like two things like I wanted to ask you um do you think um okay so going way back uh with the whole Cinnabon thing do you have to like almost thank that bully like for bullying you? Because it, it was almost <laughs> like a fate thing because, you know, I led you to your mom getting you a Cinnabon and, and that whole story. Um, so, and then you touched on how like some people just get roles and you can like work your ass off. So do you believe in fate or do you think part of this industry is like fate luck or is it like all hard work and busting your ass? For me, uh, what I've come to learn is that. It's everything combined. It's like you have to put in the hard work. You also, uh, so it's like hard work, 
and then not being an asshole, uh, <laughs> having people in your life who will call you out on your shit, uh, because in this industry, it is so easy to blow your own ego up and to think you're so much more than what you're really not. Because in the end, regardless of how famous these actors are, we're all going to die at some point. It's all, it's all, all going to be meaningless at some point. So, uh, so it's kind of like you have to, gauge yourself and also your terms of like happiness like you know um uh, like if it's like you know you get older and you have a family like are you going to sacrifice going to your son's like high school graduation just because you're like oh i can't go because i have an addition yeah and so it's kind of like finding a compromise between all the and knowing that like just because you pass this addition doesn't mean it's the end of your career it's like there's going to be more jobs and so it's like would you rather sacrifice just an audition be just or, or do, would you rather sacrifice a once in a lifetime opportunity um and so i think for me it was just uh i think it's just like you know finding it's doing the hard work doing doing uh oh my i'm blanking out so doing the hard work and <laughs> it's okay uh, it happens to us all the time yeah, yeah. i'm just going to say yeah. So I think what it ultimately is, is just like, uh, you have to have a combination thing and just having a good head on your shoulder and knowing that your acting career is just a small part of your entire life. And it's easier said than done because once you are an actor, it's, it's, it's so your identity. easy. It's your, it's your identity. You're kind consumed of. by it. You're surrounded by people who are, you know, busting their butts off to do it. And so when they find success, um, and you don't, it's like you have to learn to truly be happy for them and know that, you know, your time will come. And so what I start, you know, because I've started taking a position of like advising actors who are either below me, quote unquote, below me in terms of their work status or higher than me, who are kind of jaded about the industry is that like, um, it's like with all the things I said, but the, the other thing that actors, most actors don't really do is follow ups, which is like, People don't like to remember the people they worked with, which is like, let's say you worked on a commercial three years ago and then you decide, hey, I want to send an email to that director. I want to send a letter to the producers who got me on this. And most actors don't realize that that simple action of just saying, hey, I know it's been a few years. Uh, we worked on together on this. How have you been doing? How is life treating you? Like it gets yeah. you so far. So I that's like really social fun. networking, not a often. That's like having a high social IQ. That's just smart. Yeah. Well, I've heard this a lot though from uh, some of the higher end actors is that they say you'd be surprised the amount of people that do not send thank you cards or follow up cards. I know uh, everybody knows uh, who is Deadpool. I just had to say everybody knows and I forgot his name. Ryan uh, Reynolds. Ryan Reynolds. Yes. Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> Jeez. Um, Ryan Reynolds still sends handwritten thank you cards to the directors he's worked with. And he's a big time multimillionaire, uh, you yes. know, and, and he was one of those guys that's saying that makes a difference. That that's one of those things that you'd be surprised how many people get a small part and then they don't do anything and they just look for the next part and forget what they did. And it's interesting to hear you say that because I think it's the same with the with what we're doing with the podcast as well too. follow up just saying, hey, thanks. Whereas I think, you know, that might make the difference. So um, it's interesting to hear you say that. So would you would you actually say most actors don't do that? Like they yes. don't send the card back or most, whatever. Most actors don't do that. Most actors don't do the small things. Uh, it's it's the little things that uh, can sustain your career because it's like even if a, an actor I know got lucky and books a huge blockbuster, like that doesn't guarantee that they will have a career for the next 20, 30, 40 years. Um, because to have a career that long, and that's just why. I, uh, my inspirations, my role models are people like Brian Cranston, because oh, when man. he started out, like not only was he a trained motherfucker, like this guy like worked his butt off to be the best actor he can be, but he like was so grateful for every job he did, even if it was like a fifty dollar Power Ranger voiceover, um, that he that everyone loved him, everyone wanted to work with him again, and so he just had that mentality of like working hard you know, studying hard, following up with everyone you ever worked with, really be genuine about it. Don't be just like a superficial person like, oh, yeah, what what else can you help me with in my life? It's more like, no, I'm thankful that I've met you, that I'm grateful that you're here. And so 
that that mentality, like, yes, he didn't quite hit success when he first started for like 10, 15 years, right. but he kept doing it. And then at some point, it's going to strike. It has to strike because yeah. when someone works like that and does all that hard work and follow ups and is passionate and goes and to film festivals. Talent. Yeah, and goes to film festivals, meets the hottest news, uh, producers, directors, writers, you know, goes, takes them out for like, you know, coffee or lunch or whatever. And you just do that for like, like if you do that every week for five years minimum, like so you're going to find, you're going to have a momentum. You may not be in a blockbuster. You may not be a star, but there's going to be a momentum. It is undeniable. And so, uh, I think. So I think that's just really what it is. And then and then the rest people will say, well, how long will it take? Well, the thing is, like, I don't know how long it will take. It could take <laughs> it could take 10 years. It could take yeah. 20 years. I mean, like uh, I've all, I've seen actors like this year have booked really big things and they've been at it for 10, 15 years, struggling with one liner co-stars and whatnot. And like one person I know, this woman named Kelly Marie Tran, she's the new female lead of Star Wars Episode eight. And I'm like. If she wow. can do that, if she can do it, and she was struggling her butt off doing like internet sketches for college humor and funny <laughs> or die and doing yeah. one liners for silly NBC shows. And now she's on Star Wars. I mean, like I cannot find a more inspirational story. Yeah, than that's her. super inspiring. Um, but, I just want to say one thing about Cranston, not to cut you off, Donna. I apologize. Oh, no um, uh, Brian Cranston is amazing. I'm a, I'm also a big fan of his and I'm, I was really happy that he got so much um, notoriety and fame for uh, Breaking Breaking Bad, you know, his right. performance in that. And um, after that show, he just blew up. Like he was widely recognized as like this amazing actor. And and mm -hmm. it it did happen for him later in his career. Like he's a little bit older, but it still happened for him. And it's re like you said, it's really inspiring. Yeah, yeah. I just I had something to hit on earlier too that that you were talking about people getting roles where you think they're possibly less talented than you or, or, uh, you know, bless you <laughs> or, uh, or whatever the case may be. I always wondered because I see people and it's really funny because I watch the Mythbusters guys and they say, Jamie, who's the, the more callous of the two, the camera loves him. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And do you think it's strange when you see a bad actor um, who's bad when you see him, but the camera picks up on him for some reason and the camera loves him. And then the guy keeps getting roles for reasons unbeknownst to you. I am not surprised whatsoever. When, uh, when it comes to, uh, actors who work primarily in television and film, it's, it's amazing what editing can do. And we've seen it. Like I've seen it, like in the, there was a 30 rock segment where Alec Baldwin was trying to film like a, a commercial and he's so bad at it. They had to do like they said it was like 70 takes. And so not Alec Baldwin himself, the character he was playing. And so by the end of the product, it looks amazing. Like it looks like, wow, he's really knows what he's doing. And what the commentary was that like the actor can be outright terrible, but with the right music, with the right editing, with the right camera angles, like as long as the actor can say his lines, it can look good. <laughs> and so they've done experiments on it they've done experiments where they just had a non-actor he just sat there and they told him just sit there don't do anything and then they had multiple film editors doing different music cues different anger uh, ang uh camera angles and one was able to portray that he was grieving the loss of his wife the other was <laughs> contemplating that's murdering insane. someone that's insane and it's you like, can have like a a, a you know, half dead person, <laughs> like they can't even spit out a line and they could just create something out of that. Exactly. And the thing is like, not to knock them off because I know actors bust their balls up working on those shows, but most procedural crime dramas we see, for example, CSI, criminal minds, whatnot. There's really not that much acting unless you're you the don't villain, say. <laughs> unless you're the villain of the week who gets to play like this delicious, like crazy person. But the main leads just come up to, they just show up to set, say their lines, literally just say their lines. There's no, there's nothing more to it. And then the they get their look. Yep. The shock look. They get their paycheck and they go home. Oh, or, um, or the crinkly eye look. I've noticed that they do the little crinkle in the eyes and keep all the same facial expressions. Yep. And then that's it. Tilt your head to the left, crinkle eyes. Okay. Good. Done for the day. <laughs> so I think uh, the actors I respect uh, like the most are the ones who not only do television film, but they do like stage work. So one guy who in particular who's like 
Uh, he's really he's young and he does both is Jake Gyllenhaal. Like Jake Gyllenhaal is more tuned to doing dark indie films. And then when he's not doing that, he's doing Broadway. Like last year, he played Seymour in, Su- in Little Shop of Horrors. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I had no idea that Jake Gyllenhaal could sing. And so I saw the YouTube clips. You can find him on YouTube. And he's a singer. He's like he wow. played this really nerdy, nerdy guy. And then this year he's going to play like this sex maniac, like ADD guy on this play called Burn This. And I'm like, wow, like this guy is someone like that's a like a role model inspiration. That's the same thing with Brian Cranston. The re- commonality between Brian Cranston and Jake Gyllenhaal and these people are that they are so they their talent comes from doing theater. Their talent comes from doing like because when you're performing live in front of an audience, there's no camera to rely on there's no cutting there's no editing so if an actor is excellent in the theater world and knows how to modify himself in the camera like the film tv world those actors like they're gonna do extremely well and we see them like the ones that we're most drawn to like michael fassbender daniel day lewis i believe daniel day lewis all of these guys what all of them have in common is they they do theater they do theater work when they're not shooting a film. During the summer, they'll do a, a little play here and there, and then they that's how they hone their craft. And those actors are the ones um, I think actors all around should be inspired by, not by people like you know who just do TV work and that's all they get off on. Like you know, and I don't want to knock them off either because in the end, you do what you got to do. But I think if we call ourselves artists, we have to strive more than just say the criminal diagnostic of this week's episode and do something (laughs) that means more. And, you know, the whole idea of being an artist is that like, you know, in the Greek era, the ancient Greek era, they were there to change lives. They were there to make people cry, to have them have a cathartic moment. We don't really have that anymore because we're kind of ADD about everything. I mean, I, I have to, I know I'm the ADD. Like my girlfriend always accuses me of like looking at my phone all the time. And that's <laughs> absolutely true. Like I am, uh, I am guilty as hell about that. I do so, the same. yeah, yeah yes. I, I think that's something that does kill our, our, our fascination with good movies. Cause I, I've noticed it's the, the longer the movie industry is around, the shorter the time frame is to action. The shorter the movie is, the the more flashy it is, mm-hmm. um, and it's interesting that you hit upon that because I I do firmly believe that everything is now like ADD, and uh, I mean on a couple of points that you're hitting one I do think unfortunately um, with a lot of this acting people hold certain actors high which I don't think they should I think if mm-hmm. you've ever taken an acting class before if you've ever done stage performances uh, you learn you know, the good from the bad. You see those people on like those serial crime dramas, which there's no shortage of doing absolutely nothing. And people are like, Oh, I love him. He's so great. You're like, he's not doing anything. All he is yep. is just a face. Um, but the other thing too is, is quality movies. You know, one of my all time favorites is 2001, a space odyssey, mm-hmm. which is a masterclass of nonverbal storytelling or even, even alien. Uh, we just had this conversation before, but the very first one, if you ever watch, uh, Ridley Scott's commentary on it, he even says you don't need to get to the rock and roll right away. You know, you can let it build up. You can let yep. it kind of like simmer under the surface. And um, I do think that's kind of missing in, in today's at least consumer society where they don't necessarily want that. I don't know if you if you feel similar. Dude. Um, what I feel is that like in the Hollywood studio world, they still have they're they're kind of on this train of like let's just remake everything. Let's just you know <laughs> do yeah. all of this. Um. But I think in the TV world, we're starting to – I feel like we're in the golden age of TV because we're seeing like – especially on cable TV shows and well, on well, like Netflix, stuff. like Amazon Prime. We're seeing these really like bold, provocative like TV shows. Like for me, my personal favorites are like Fargo, uh, the FX TV series. Like is it is it is amazing how much time they take and it's just like the actors really you know take their time doing everything. And same with the people behind it. And then recently I saw, I was watching the Netflix show Stranger Things. And I just got into that, Edward. I'm on episode three and it blew me away. I love the 80s nostalgia, but go ahead, go ahead. I think for me, what I have to say without spoiling for anyone who hasn't seen it yet is that it takes their time. Like there's nothing, like obviously there are tense moments. There's like things that like the reveals will come and it's kind of, it hits hard, but 
they really take their time with the cast, especially the kids. And so it's not often we see uh, TV shows like that. But then the only way we can see any quality like that is going to be on Netflix is going to be on, you know, FX or like um, on HBO, especially there's another great show called Night Of uh, with Riz Ahmed and John Turturro. Like that's another show like where they take their time. So I think it's just like consumers are flocking towards that. And in terms of cinema, we're seeing it like a lot more sequels. They're not doing well. They're bombing. No, they're, they're terrible. The quality is, is uh, atrocious. Because they're just trying to make a quick buck and there's no like real effort into like the scripts. And and uh, I'm like, OK, I'm not a fan of Michael Bay. Like, Edward, I don't know if you are, but like his <laughs> <Nope>. movies, <laughs> I, I, I can't stand them. Like some of his movies are OK. Like The Rock, I appreciated it for what it was. Uh, can't stand a Transformers movies, none of that crap. I just think there are a lot of flash and pop, no substance. Um, but Don, you brought up something about, um, you know, uh, people having a low attention span with film and not appreciating them. One of my favorite films is Drive with Ryan Gosling. Mm, I think the, mm-hmm. the film is a masterpiece and people hate on it. They're like, oh, it was boring. It there took was too aw- long. awkward pauses. I'm like, the movie is, it, it's it's it does such a fantastic job of conveying emotion without words. I I love that movie to death. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean the, that's a great movie. And it, when you, when you were talking about it, it randomly made me think of like another movie, even though it was kind of out there in a the sci-fi element, like the film Looper, uh, with Joseph Gordon-Levitt. And yes, and, it uh, was Bruce it was a sci-fi blockbuster with Bruce Willis. Um, but it still had its indie filmmaking roots, which is it, you see it in the little moments, like you see um. That's oh god. Um, there was one of the bad guys, and you see him drinking his water. And most movies, they'll just you know they don't even make a moment of it. But you just watch him drink the entire glass to its last drop, mm-hmm. and the patience they have of just you know just showing that is something we normally don't see. Which is what when you mentioned drive, that's what it made me think because it's yeah. like they take their time. It builds with those tension. Things. It does, and so it worked for that particular character in Looper because. He was scary. Like he was like, we don't know what he's gonna do, and the right. way he's drinking that, I've never seen water being drank in such it's, a sinister way. So. Yeah, it's it's just like um, No Country for Old Men. Um, ah, yes. Jeez, uh, what's his name? Uh, well, anyway, Javier Javier, Javier Bardem. Chigur. Bardem. Yes, he plays yeah. Sugar. There's a scene where he goes into into this convenience store and he's eating peanuts, and he has an mm-hmm. interaction with the clerk, and he like crumbles up a wrapper and it goes on a counter and like unfolds and there's like a awkward tense moment where you're like is he gonna kill this old guy or 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 what you know that that's another movie that's amazing to me and people hate on that movie i don't get it it's just like we said what we said earlier it's just the 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 add nature of society and just whatever and so it's like like yesterday uh i rewatched uh in terms of just comparing like so recently star trek beyond came out and then I saw that, and then yesterday I was rewatching Star Trek IV: The Voyage Home, hmm. and there's a huge difference in just like oh style, you know, everything style. It's just like storytelling, the patience that that film took, the fact that music didn't really come on often. Like when it did, it, it came at a very significant moment. But for the most part, it was just no music. It was just long camera cuts, you know, characters interacting with each other. And then with Star Trek Beyond, while I did enjoy it to a degree it was like explosion in your face like you yeah. know let's just quick camera cuts let's it's just forget action <laughs> yeah so it's just it's un. i think it's just like with the blockbuster level uh they all they're all on that same channel and i think what's the good part is that the audience the viewers are getting tired there's like a fatigue now they're like okay we're officially tired from this and it shows because Movies aren't doing that well. like like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. The sequel did terribly oh, compared God, to the first terrible. one. They butchered, Good. they butchered <laughs> a, a piece of my childhood right there. I was so mad when <laughs> before the movie was released, Edward and I read something about Michael Bay was gonna make them aliens. I'm like, damn it! I was like, yeah. I was like out right there. Like as soon as I read that, I'm like, what is this crap? I think it's like this interesting concept where like they takes they have to take a very simple premise that worked for a TV show and they have to add a twist to make it more i don't know what it is more they have to complex for the, more for the one up it, more new generation and on that note it's kind of like 
this is where something I noticed too in, in the topic of like beefing up things for the sake of making the characters more interesting. So recently yeah. there was a there was a Batman anime movie that had a lot of like hype and then controversy and now controversy, the Batman the killing joke. Mm-hmm. Um and everyone was excited because Mark Hamill, the Luke Skywalker guy, is back as a joker and everyone yep. was excited. And I was excited too. I was like, oh my god, they're adapting the killing joke. But then then I haven't seen it, but then my fan, my friends have been telling me they're like they added all this backstory about Batgirl, and now she has sex with Bruce Wayne, oh, and I'm like, wait, that never happened in the Killing yeah. Joke. She was just Batgirl, and so uh, a fan, because I I went to Comic Con uh, two weeks ago, they had the world premiere screening of it, and a fan who dressed up in Joker cosplay asked them like, I like the movie, but I don't understand what was the point of this sexual element now they're like oh well we want to make sure we want to make Batgirl a complex three-dimensional character and then as soon as that one of the producers said that there's like one random audience guy who yells uh yeah so you can make you can make her like the sex object of bruce wayne and then the producer got pissed and he says you want to say that again pussy and then all the audience was like the audience was like whoa okay this is getting (laughs) crazy so oh my god the good news about that is just like uh, kind of tying everything we were saying before. The audience, I think they're getting smarter. They're, they want better things. They want better material. They want more like truly th- three-dimensional characters, whether it be like on women or like people of color or just like, you know, LGBT communities, just like or just stories overall. That, yeah, and it's – go ahead, Edward. I'm sorry. Oh, no. I'm pretty much finished. I'm just saying that we want – they want more of that instead of the same old, same old things that might have worked in the past 20, 30 years. But I think our our generation, even though a lot of people like to take crap on the millennials and being like, oh, you guys use social media a lot, which we do. But I think we're becoming smarter and being more aware of like better. There are better things out there. Yeah. Ed- Edward, uh, personal story. Um about you know you mentioned about the audience being smarter um and it's true and it's and it's evident in the box office numbers you know like the movies that they don't take their time or have quality scripts or like effects or acting they bomb they just freaking mm-hmm. bomb um i i saw um independence day 2 when it came out and i was excited for it because i saw the first one when i was a kid you know and it was this nostalgia thing for me i was like fuck yeah i'm like independence day 2 i'm in and I saw it and I was so disappointed. It was so terrible. Yeah. In my opinion, it just, they over explained everything. Like the audience is stupid. It was just the, it was, it was bad. It was just terrible. That's why yeah. I refused to go see it, by the way. I just wanted to add that in there. I, I try to speak with my money before you hop in there, but, uh, especially with something like that, I think from a distance, especially, you know, Independence Day 2 resurgence, there's like one guy from the first one and it's all flashy. I didn't go to see that. I don't know if you had the same reaction, Edward, but I didn't even want to put my money into that to encourage I, that to be made. I had a very interesting reaction uh, watching the sequel. I agree with you. Like it was a it was a ultimately mediocre movie, and it was trying to do the same old thing that the first movie did, but it didn't have the charm. It didn't have like the whimsy, and it, a lot had to do with the fact that Will Smith was not present, and so. Uh, but what was also fascinating, and we're, and this is what kind of segue into like the next topic, which is like, we were talking about how like consumers are being smarter about like choosing their movies. But in Independence Day 2, what I've noticed is that it was probably the most egregious example of Chinese money being displayed. And here's what I mean by Chinese money. It's like, I in the movie, that. uh, you have like, you know, you, there's the actress Angela Baby and there's an actor named Chin Han. And they represent the China front end, and you know they represent the Chinese side. And it's no, with no doubt that Independence Day two had Chinese money. Most they were pushing Hollywood, that. Ho, most Hollywood studios actually rely on Chinese money to get even their films made because it's just getting so expensive now to make movies now those kind of movies. And so the when the now this is where the Chinese film industry comes in, and this is where it's like. It's interesting being an Asian American actor knowing both sides of the world. Like, it, so we have Hollywood here and we have the Chinese film industry. Whatever money that, let's say, 20th Century Fox, Sony, you know, Marvel or any of those uh, guys have in terms of money, they have a lot of money, but they are dwarfed by what the Chinese film industry have. They have nothing compared to the Chinese film industry. That's interesting. So, I didn't know that. 
Yeah, well, so, it's, like, it's the reason why Red Dawn had to change their stuff from a Chinese invasion on the remake yes. to a Korean invasion. No Hollywood studios can ever portray China as the villain. Like, yeah. from now until forever. Um, <laughs> and so, the most recent example, there was a lot of controversy uh, with a particular film called The Great Wall, starring Matt, Matt Damon. And the reason why it was controversial was that it's a movie about the Great Wall being built. And, you know, when people hear that, they're like, oh... Okay, obviously Chinese people because it was during that time period. But then you have this film, and the main star is Matt Damon. Is white, yeah. And Which so, kind of <laughs> and but then it's like when you first hear, like that's really weird. But then, like then you really find out what the movie's about. So then it's not just some historical retelling. It's kind of like the reason why the wall was being built was because you're fending off from dragons. And so there's like this fantastical element added in, and. Then, then yet when I when I looked further into it, and this is where I, um, I got opinions of people who worked in this film or elsewhere, that um, Matt Damon is one of the most successful box office movie stars in China. Like China loves the crap out of Matt Damon, <laughs> and so the people who made The Great Wall, people think, oh, it has to be Hollywood. Like Hollywood made this film. They're like, no, China made this film. Wow. Hollywood was Hollywood provided the writers and the producers like uh some one of the writers i think is edward zwick who did glory and uh, the last samurai these people are making writing it but it's china ship all the way they cast matt damon because they're like okay this is going to be china's most expensive film to date i think the budget's like 130 million dollars which is the most expensive they've ever done and if they get matt damon in this film i mean does yes who cares if it's historically accurate or not. It doesn't matter. <laughs> this movie will make like at it'll, least five hundred million. No, it'll yeah. kill. And the thing is, I guarantee it. And I, and the thing is, I can't blame them for that because, like, we just look like right now, Jason Bourne, number one at box office, sixty million dollar opening. If I was a producer, I'd be like, okay, yeah, I'll have Matt Damon play an Asian guy, whatever. It's yeah, not he's hot right now. It's not ethically correct. It's not. It's not what. It's it's totally wrong. But man, is that guy making money? Right. And this yeah. is where, yeah. <laughs> this I, is, anyways, th this is what I wanted to hit on. Actually, it's funny. I had a question lined up for you, and I don't mean to interrupt, but you recently, well, at some point, I should say, you wrote an article about white actors playing historical POC, which is uh, people of color. Yes. Um, and you covered the topic, kind of whitewashing in TVs and movies. And it's interesting that you have the kind of angle, at least it sounds like you're having, because. For me, and this is what I've said all the time, especially with with Tilda Swinton mm -hmm. landing the uh, the role in uh, Doctor Strange, uh, oh, it was you. yeah, yeah. So um, I, this is what I tell everybody. I said, you know, those people who pay the paychecks get to make the decisions. It's 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 one of those things that if you're making art. You shouldn't tell – like if you're painting a painting, you shouldn't tell the person what kind of paint they can use. And, and this is just the example is that movies, you pay to go see them. You don't have to go see them, one. And two, like you said, if, if somebody's hot, that's something. But also if the person's footing the bill, they can foot the bill for whomever they want. That's kind of the 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 pleasure of being that wealthy or being an investor. You know what I mean? Is that kind of like what you're going oh, yeah. for? Um. I, totally. That's what I'm going for. But at the same time, it's like uh, I'm glad that there's like, you know, we're seeing more like, up you know, there's more like, you know, out, you know, like outrage and like responses so that like, you know, the thing that it still doesn't make sense to me. Uh, like recently when uh, the the other thing, they, the ghost in a shell with uh, Scarlett Johansson playing uh, <laughs> Motoko Kusanagi, which every time I say it, I cannot take it seriously. I just like. Ah, doesn't make any sense. But at the same time, it's like it's the same Matt Damon logic. Scarlett Johansson, you know, is a hot thing right now. She's a hot commodity. Like Lucy was number one at the box office. And, you know, and in one way, it's like it's actually great for women because it's like how often do we see women being badass leads in a huge box office blockbuster drop. movie? We don't see it that often. So Besides it's kind of like Barney Weaver back in the day. I know exactly, but we don't. We even have less of that. I feel like, and so, um, so it's like, as much as I understand why they did it, and I, as much as that, you know, we can't always blame Hollywood because the people who created Ghost in a the Shell, they were totally okay with that. They were like, yeah, we love Scarlett Johansson. We don't care. Just cast her. 
because <laughs> it's like they have a part in it too. Because I've seen, like for example, there was a a book that turned into a movie. It didn't do well, but there was a book called um like the the mortal the mor- mortal instruments, and they had an Asian character in the book. And so the author was a white woman. She wrote this whole thing. And when they were casting the movie, the producers was like, can we go with a white actor instead and just say that he's half Asian, half whatever? And the, and the author was like, no, I wrote him to be an Asian guy. We're going to find the sexiest Asian guy as possible, and we're going to cast goddamn Asian. And so she was so adamant about that. They're like, okay, fine. And so then I learned that it's like, you know, Whenever these whitewashing news happen, I always try to like, you know, at first I always was like, oh, man, screw Hollywood, screw the, all of that. But then I'm like, wait a minute, let's try to see what really happened. And more often than not, the answer becomes a lot more gray than it is black and white. Mm-hmm. Um, so with Ghost in the Shell, we can actually kind of blame the creators because they didn't really care. They didn't care that Motoko was white or not. And so most of the outrage is coming from people of color, like Asian Americans and whatnot. I'm kind of like annoyed, but I'm like, come on, man. You can give uh, someone unknown Asian American actress that role and she's going to be a star. Mm-hmm. Like you give them that chance and they will become that star that we don't see. And so when people say, well, there are no famous, good looking Asian American actors who can be A-listers. They're like, well, that's because you don't cast them. You have to she cast them. Fine as hell. So it's like Lucy Liu is very adamant. Oh, like she gorgeous. and Constance Wu are like the most vocal people when it comes to like, okay, we gotta like change this industry. We gotta like, you know, change how people perceive, you know, Asians or like minorities but play only a specific type of role. And so it's like, uh, I believe it's just like, you know, uh, we have to be aware of like, we have to be <clears throat> conscious of like, if it's a historical, we have to play like if it was like a historical African setting, we're not going to have Tom Hanks play the main guy. <laughs> right. Like, right. And, and I think Hollywood understands that part. But when it comes to like Asian settings and whatnot, there's like always like a certain leeway. There's like, well, you know, we could totally have so and so be in this. And so and then it's just that kind of mentality is like, you know, that needs to be critiqued upon and needs to be an analyzed. And it means like, OK. Does that actually make sense? No. For example, Last Airbender, the M. Night Shyamalan <laughs> adaptation, like, it, you know, I don't mind, like, one of the leads being a white guy. Like, I'm not saying that there can't be white leads. It's just like when, when in that film, you had every single person as a white person and that a bad guy was brown. Um, <laughs> and, yeah. but then all the background extras for their tribe people were, darker like in the yeah. like there was the the eskimo people <laughs> the background extras they were all darker and yeah. then these two are like the lily white pale actors and i'm like okay that's it's like gods name. of egypt like people were shitting on oh that. my god with, uh, gerard butler and the guy from uh game of thrones it's you like that? how do they look egyptian on any level like but you know like you said edward i get it because they're trying to like you know get their fan base in and make the most money and Yes. But, um, see, like, it's one I'm of a- those things too, though, but back in the old Grecian days when they were performing, you know, boys would play the roles of, uh, women, little boys, you know, so it's, it's, for me, like, I get it, and, and, and not to interrupt you, Dave, I'll let you run with it, but just to hit on the point, like, I do wish there was more, uh, variety on the screen in every aspect, not just actors, but. Yeah. Um, the thing is though, is that if somebody wants to, and, and, you know, they want to commit to a role like that, more kudos to them. I mean, if they can transform themselves, because essentially that's the role of acting. That was the original intent is mm-hmm. to create a character whom wasn't that person. That's at least my viewpoint of acting. So if it's, you know, race, whatever height, color, skin color, if it's different, then that's just an actor doing what an actor does. But I do think it would be nice to have a, a bit more variety. You know, I don't want right. to see Scarlett Johansson in everything. But uh, Dave, sorry, continue on with your no, point. I, man. I was just going to say that, um, you know, it, it's funny, like when you think when I think about it now, since you brought this whole thing up, Edward, uh, not to make it like a, a controversial like racing, but at one point, like black actors weren't getting props. But now it's at a point where, you know, they're getting a lot of roles and and, uh, and acclaim and everything for like their roles. But like you really don't see it with like like how you said it were like with Asians or Hispanics. Um, Benicio mm-hmm. del Toro is kind of an, an exception. Right. Um, I'm Hispanic myself. And like I, I try to get into the acting business, but. 
Um, but as far as like uh, diversity, you see like uh, a lot of white actors, black actors, but not much else for leading roles. That's that's a valid thing. Right. I would say, uh, I mean, when it comes to like black actors, even even within their realm, it's like there's still problematic perceptions. I mean, there's still like, you know, yes, we're seeing a lot more black leads, which is great, like Scandal or How to Get Away with Murder. We're seeing them take the center fold of the stage. We're seeing them lead um, these TV shows and films. And we're seeing like, you know, like Black Panthers coming out and like, you know, oh, that's yeah. going to be an all black cast. He and just so- held us pretty hot right now. Yeah. And so it's like, but the thing is like, it took them that long. It's like only like now. Mm -hmm. And so, and even then we're quite not 100% there yet. It's like, you know, we're still seeing, you know, we're still seeing like, um, when it comes to like, you know, the movies that do well in Oscars, especially for, it tends to be, and I'm not trying to say that that's the only thing, but like statistically, the films that do well with black actors getting Oscar attention are movies about slavery. And so, Rarely we'll see a movie that's about like everyday life, about everyday struggles that hasn't to do with like, you know, living in the ghetto or, you know, slavery times or whatever, because yeah. it's like and it's but the unfortunate thing is like on, that's all we see, not just, you know, Hollywood, but also media. You know, yeah. we're always seeing that. So it's like with Asians, too. You know, the only attention we'll see of Asians is just like, oh, being smart, hard workers math science blah 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 blah. <laughs> yeah 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 and so it's just i think what it really is is that like what's great about this decade is that with social media with twitter youtube and vimeo and all that stuff that we're seeing people saying hey that's not us like we are more than that and with if the, and i've noticed like success is being blown up where like for example, Issa Rae, you know, she had a series called like the Diaries of Awkward Black Girl, and now she has her own HBO series. And so it's great to see filmmakers, uh, whether women or people of color or from the LGBT community saying, hey, look, you know, we're not like what Hollywood says we are. We are, you know, this is the other side you haven't seen. And so what I would tell people is like oh, when they complain, because I was right there with them, like, oh, you know, like, why can't they portray our stories correctly? Why can't they do this? And I would say, I hear you. You're valid. Your complaints are valid. And I completely agree with you. However, we have to do something about it, which is to create. So if we call ourselves artists, like if we're <clears throat> actors complaining that, like, why aren't there more people of like me, you know, playing leads, then we have to get ourselves to become better than just being an actor like learn how to write learn how to produce learn how to direct learn how to do more than just act and just talk on facebook be the change instead I, of talking about yeah it. Yes. yeah like and, a robert rodriguez i mean that's he started a whole network around hispanic uh shows and you yes. know everything like that the the whole hispanic culture that he's put through but in a way where like you're saying he produced he directed he wrote he he ran with the camera, you know, and he hired uh, Hispanic actors, but he made it applicable across the field, opening up a whole new fold. Yes, exactly. You know, it's crazy. Um, not to cut you off, Don, I'm sorry, but like I'm a big fan of Bruce Lee, like watched all his movies like growing up. And when you think about him, like what was it like in the 70s or whatever, mm-hmm. like, way back, he was a lead. He was a lead when it was like unheard of, like an Asian action lead. You know, that's it's crazy. It's funny you bring that up because it's like Bruce Lee broke barriers by be- being that guy. And, you know, he was he was actually seen as masculine, sexy. He was just like this this powerhouse. But at the same time, you know, you know, while he had success with that, when they were making the series Kung Fu, uh, which they actually like the people who created Kung Fu wanted Bruce Lee to be it because it was all about him. It was like a, a guy who had European blood in him, which was Bruce Lee, because Bruce Lee does have European blood in him. And they're like, okay, Bruce Lee, we, we're going to have Bruce Lee. And so they were all geared for him to be in it. And then that's when the network kicked in and said, we do not want an Asian guy to be the lead. Mm-hmm. And that's when they replaced him David and had Carradine. David Carradine. And right. so it was like as much success that he had then, it's like there was still like one step forward, two steps back. And the interesting is you go even p- beyond that. Back in the 1940s and 1950s, there was an, an actor named James Shigeta. He was a J- Japanese-American actor, and he was the romantic lead. He was the romantic lead in these film noir movies. Like there was one called The Crimson Kimono where he actually like kissed the white girl, which when that happened, people were like, like – unheard of back then. Whoa, 
And so he actually made a career of himself, like being that sexy, you know, leading detective guy. And then that was the 1940s. And then as I feel like when World War II kicked in and people were like scared of Japanese people, mm-hmm. that once that kicked in, like there was this change. And all of a sudden, like Asians were like, oh, my God, you know, sexy detectives or whatever to becoming like, you know. And then there was, of course, their wave of like the Kung Fu thing. And then it kind of just started regressing into like, well, let's just have them be like the 16 candles guy. Let's just have him be yeah. the long duck dung guy. And so – it's it's interesting seeing the ways and patterns of that and also like who is the villain of the decade like now unfortunately like all of my middle eastern actors are going to get a lot of work or are getting work because the only roles out there is terrorists <laughs> yeah and so especially is, in arnold movies but he's yeah. not really making movies <laughs> <Yeah>. anymore <laughs> but they're still going to get cast as terrorists because it's like if they make a tv show about terrorism it's the hot new thing isis and all of that mm-hmm. so but then we see the problem with that kind of thing. It's like if all the roles only Middle Eastern actors can get is terrorists and not like everyday secretaries or whatnot, then all we're ever going to see and believe is like, well, you know, because the media does play a factor in what we see and believe in out there. And oh, so, big time. Big oh, time. Sure. so it's like if all we see in Middle Eastern is like brown people like, oh, they're bad people, you know. Yes, there's a part of us going like, no, they're not all like that. They're all good people. But because the media has done a way of like brainwashing us that we start to kind of secretly believe like when we go to the airport, and we see a guy with a hijab, a woman with a hijab. They were like, oh, you know, we're not going to say it out loud, but we're going to be like right. oh, a little bit suspicious. And I have to catch myself doing that where I'm like, why? Like, you know, I remember being in a, when I was flying to Korea, like I heard uh, one of the uh, passengers, he was talking to someone and he said, Allah Akbar. And I noticed some people were like kind of like looking at him, just like glancing at him. And I know what that glance meant. They were kind of yeah. like, oh, Allah. Uh oh. Yeah, yeah. You know, I hope this, I hope. Uh. And so it's just, it's, I think in the role of Hollywood is just like, a, you know, there is danger to like, you know, portraying. You know, these kind of characters constantly. And then when people are trying to make progress, for example, uh, the Ghostbusters reboot. Yes, it wasn't as good as the original, but I, but I watched it. It was enjoyable experience for me. And more importantly, we got to see badass, you know, smart scientists who are women and they were just kicking butt and there was no love story. And the idiot person who was in the cast happened to be the guy, which was Chris Hemsworth, which he did amazingly. And so. Even that movie got so much crap. They're like, "Ugh, these social justice warriors are trying to take over Hollywood. And I'm like, it's not that they're trying to take over Hollywood. It's just they want to be taken seriously. Like they don't yeah. always have to be, you know, the dumb sex object. And unfortunately, we we're still kind of there because if there's that much backlash for just women, like, you know, like imagine just the backlash is just like seeing more black leads, Asian leads, Latino leads. Like, but let's 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 be honest, I, though. If you put a quality movie, you won't hear that backlash. And, and I'm not saying I haven't seen Ghostbusters. But what I mean by that and don't don't just wait on the uh, judgment here <laughs> is is uh, Alien, the very first Alien. You can say the franchise, whatever it is. You right. had one badass motherfucker, Sigourney Weaver, kicking ass and taking names. Nobody doubt her. Nobody. Nobody called the movie out. There was no hate for it. Everybody regards it as one of the best movies ever. But it wasn't built out of this, like, I feel, at least I feel like I should well, say. Well, she broke it, barriers, dude, to be honest. That right, right. That was in the 70s, 70s. But it wasn't, it wasn't built like, oh, we just need to have one in. It was, the story was written that way, and it was written for a strong female lead, and that was a badass movie. And it was good. Like, I feel some of the times with this, and just with the Ghostbusters thing, I should say, just hitting on that, I feel like it was done just to appease a certain demographic, um, which is fine if you want to do that. Like I said, if you have the money and you want to make it, then so be it. Um, but for me, like, I still love strong female leads that aren't, like, downplayed into anything. You, do you know what I'm trying to get I, at here? You know what? I completely agree with you because, like, I – so. Aliens to me will be like the one of the most like the best films where you can have a female character and she's just that. There's nothing added to it. Um, like Wait, to me, it's you better. Said, I'm not a cut off editor. Did you say Aliens the sequel? Oh, don't start this. Yes, don't, you don't even yes. start this. If you listen to the okay. podcast, he meant I'm Alien. Such... He meant Alien the first one, not no. the second one. No, he meant the second. Alien. No, he meant the Alien. first one. No, 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 Alien. 
<laughs> oh boy. Alien, first one, it was a great, fantastic horror film for sure. But yeah. the reason why Aliens to me was stood out more to me was because like we saw Sigourney Weaver be multiple versions. Like we got to see her be a badass. We got to see her be a nurturing person. Vulnerable. We got yeah. vulnerable, like everything. And we had like a crew. We had a dynamic crew, uh, that we all mem- remember the characters. We remember Hicks. We remember Hudson. Uh, Hudson. Like it's just like, so like <laughs> to me, enjoyment factor aliens rank a little bit higher, just a teensy bit. I agree. And, I agree. But going, but the reason why, regardless, I'm on the aliens, alien aliens to me, like to me, will still beat, like for example, Star Wars: Force Awakens. I'm so glad they had Daisy Ridley beat Lee. But what I've noticed um, was that she would have to make statements like, "Oh, I can totally do that. I can totally do this. You know, you don't have to hold my hand." Like it's like the writer's way of like saying, "Look, sh- look how tough she is." That's look exactly how- what I'm saying. Like they're pandering to the audience, whereas. So- Alien I, and aliens didn't pander at all. They're like, here's this character. That's it. I totally agree with that. But and then so I think the bright side I can see, like even if they did pander, even if Ghostbusters reboot did pander by having all female cast, is like we got to see them. We got to see four, all four of them do their thing. And it's like for me, that's like even though there are detractors, like it is pandering. It is that I to me, I think it is one step in the right direction because the next step is to not just have an all female class and saying, look at that, but like, like, you know, you can have a diversity of it. Like, you know, how like, co-ed movie. like a co-ed or like, a, but then, and they still keep their characters. They still keep their as essential nature of it. And I'll take this comparison to like, uh, the TV show fresh off the boat to me, fresh off the boat is a mediocre TV show. It's funny at times and terrible at others. And, you know, it's an all Asian sh- American show, which is wonderful. It's like, when, when has that ever happened? It's been like over 20 <laughs> years. But, and so people will say, well, it's kind of pandering. It's kind of like, you know, they have a little race jokes here and there. And I'm like saying, look, I totally agree with you. It's not perfect. It's not the greatest. Still you know, same thing, there. same with the Ghostbusters reboot. It's not the, half the jokes didn't land. Like it wasn't that funny all the time. There were funny moments, but it's like, they're putting it out there, like you said. It's just, it's exposure. It's just like, we just gotta keep hitting them for more than it is. And the thing with aliens is like, you know, I feel like, yes, we have that. And people say, well, we had aliens. We had Sigourney Weaver, but that was it. Because after aliens, kind of like the James Shigeta example I used in the 1940s, when did it ever happen again after that? Yeah, yeah the only was- other franchise, not to cut you guys off, the only other one I could think of that it really made a mark was Kill Bill with Uma Thurman. Oh, um, one of my she, favorites. She killed it in that. But yeah. I, I, I totally agree with you, Edward. Um, and I have to admit, I, I wasn't like feeling the all female Ghostbusters cast. Like, I'm right. not sexist. I'm just such a fanboy of the original, you know, um, because I have no problem with female leads at all. Like, I love, uh, the character, um, Ripley from Aliens. Sigourney Weaver, Uma Thurman. Um, but I just, I don't know. Ghostbusters for me, the new one. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I'll give it a go. We'll see. But, but that's, that's kind of what I'm going at though it is, is just like, just like, uh, Kill Bill and just like, you know, even the movie Spy Kids. Do you remember Spy Kids? Mm-hmm. Like how oh. innocuous and lovely that was and something probably people go, I heard of it before. Well, that was Robert Rodriguez casting yep. in all Hispanic cast. That made, you know, $600 million. I mean, it was a humongous his- Hispanic success. And he was talking to a politician. I was watching one of his, uh, film school, like, symposiums. There's only like 10 people there. And of course, I was watching online, but, um, uh, he was even saying he met up with a politician and the politician goes, well, I haven't seen any of your work. What do you do? And he goes, uh, or something along these lines. I'm sure I'm paraphrasing terribly. He goes, well, yeah, that, that spy kids, uh, that was my work. And he goes, Oh, my kids love that movie. And he goes, yeah, that was like an all Hispanic cast. You know, it's one of those things that, you know, he makes good products and it's not pandering and he's taking pride in their, in their history and their relationship and all that. You know what I mean? It's, it's that kind of, right. It's, it's the same thing that Ridley Scott did with, uh, with Sigourney Weaver. Um, right. but before we bash this out too long, I did want to jump in here and say that you are not free from the rapid fire. I'm going to go ahead. This is about the normal time we bring it in. I don't know if you're aware of what this is, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to list off a couple of this or that things. And I just okay. want you to answer fast and have fun. Sound good? Okay. Here we go. 
All right. They should get terribly. They're going to get worse as it goes on, but we'll try this. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Would you rather ride a, mo- a motorcycle or a bicycle? Bicycle. Wear eyeglasses or contacts? Contacts. Classical music or country? Classical. Ooh, climb a tree or climb the corporate ladder? Climb a tree. Tropical island or snow-capped mountain? Snow-capped mountain. Lost at sea or stuck in the Grand Canyon? Stuck in the Grand Canyon. Okay, now here's a good one. Dinner with Marlon Brando or Marilyn Monroe? Marilyn Monroe. Ooh, that was quick, man. I thought it was going to be longer. Okay, yep. leading role leading role in big budget movie or leading role in syndicated TV series? Leading role in syndicated TV series. Ooh, going for the money on that one. I like that. At least that's what I think. That's what I hear they're, they're good. But the last one, I'll ask you the last one here. And this is going to be a bit existential, but uh, Dave and I worked on this a few days ago, and I'm really proud of this one. Are you going to live forever, but you have to work in a job with no retirement, hustling French fries at a McDonald's in a bad neighborhood in Cleveland, or die young with no responsibilities as a millionaire in Malibu? I'll take the former. I'll take the living forever because I like to have some responsibility and the fact that, you know, even if it's a bad neighbor in Cleveland, it's like at least there's a community of people. So you so, do that? You would live forever and hustle French fries if that's what you had to do? I no retirement? Chose, yeah, I think I chose that also, right, Don? I don't yeah, remember. I, <laughs> we, it literally took us like two hours to develop no, that one I question. Said, I said you can sling French fries, but at least you're going to get off of work at some point. You could pop a brewski. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah but, like, but look at James Dean though, right? James Dean, rebel yeah, without but, a cause. Yeah, but then at the same time, he – I don't – how did he die again? Like I felt like did he did he drive himself off a cliff? Like what did he, what did he do? Something I honestly don't crazy remember. Happened. Let me I gotta look this up. <laughs> I don't know. The reason why I rather not take the second is that like you know with all that money and boredom, like it's just what good are you? At least with me making fries, I'm I'm at least providing some sort of happiness. You're to contributing. <laughs> so it's like me just being a rich spoiled asshole in Malibu. What? good am i providing <laughs> like none <laughs> well that's that's kind of the, the object of the question the question yeah. itself isn't really it's usually how the people respond i think that's the most interesting uh yeah. to these things <laughs> dave do you have the answer on how we how we kick the bucket oh, it, uh car crash apparently mm, car mm. crash yeah. yeah well you know it's funny as i should have changed it to hustling instead of fries i should have changed it to hustling cinnabons forever oh god that, that would, would have been the plug <laughs> <laughs> Edward, I have to say, um, man, you just, you're so down to earth. It's really refreshing, uh, to talk to someone in that circle that is just like super cool and down to earth. And I think you have like an awesome head on your shoulders. And I feel like you are truly like an artist. Like you really like, and you really love your craft and you want to be like really good at it. And, uh, that's how you come across. And man, like it was awesome having you on the show. Yeah, your demo Thank reels you. are funny too, by the way. Oh, hilarious! <laughs> we love watching your, 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 demo your reels. timing. Like your dry humor is impeccable. Like it, you're really funny. They were hilarious. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, we appreciate you being on. And uh, do you have anything you would uh, like to say to any uh, fans or people or whoever before we uh, jump off here? Uh Hmm. Sounds good. <laughs> yeah, any, yeah, any, uh, <laughs> upcoming projects, nothing. Yeah, anything you want to plug? You want to plug? Um, other than the Devious Mates nights, uh, on September 25th, I'll be in the season finale of uh this uh show called Survivor's Remorse. Um, so if you have that channel, uh, I think it's on. Oh, I forgot what show. I, oh, Showtime. It's on Showtime. Um, it's basically ballers, but with basketball players. <laughs> uh, right. so I'll be on that and then please stand by I'll be coming out sometime end of September uh, early October Um, and yeah that that's it for now until oh and then a Gatorade commercial will be coming out Um, so if you see me while on your YouTube channel that's the, the most likely it's going to be me <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. that's that's Edward right there Dave do you, do you have anything else you'd like to add Um, just Edward I wish you much success and I'm just going to just follow your career man you were great all right. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah, I agree with him, too. Uh, make sure you check him out. I'll get this one right. It's Cinnabon Monster at mm-hmm. uh, uh, dot com. Sorry. If you guys would like to interact with us or the show, make sure you hit up, uh, hit us up on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Funny Blunt Truth, uh, whatever you care for, for Edward Hong, the Cinnabon Monster, Dave and myself, Don. This has been episode 20. We'll see you on the next one. 